acids, bases and salts. Well, as I'm sure you're aware, acids are some of the most commonplace chemicals that you'll ever meet. And it's worth knowing a little bit more about their chemistry. Well, first of all, the question is, what is an acid? And the simple answer is hydrogen ions, H+. If a substance has excess hydrogen ions, lots of hydrogen ions, it will be an acid. There's more to it than that, of course. When it comes to acids, they fall into two categories, strong and weak. So let's begin with strong acids. Now, it turns out that the acids you've been using since first, second year are actually rather unusual. They're strong acids, but these strong acids are the exception rather than the norm. Let's take, say, hydrochloric acid. Well, that formula isn't really hydrochloric acid at all. That would really stand for a gas called hydrogen chloride. This gas, hydrogen chloride, only becomes an acid when it comes into contact with water. And the water carries out a remarkable transformation to this gas. This gas changes from a gas into ions. It breaks up into hydrogen ions and chloride ions. These ions are dissolved in water. And as you can see, because we've got hydrogen ions, we've got ourselves an acid. But more than that, a strong acid. Now, it sounds like that means dangerous, but it doesn't. In this context, strong means completely changed. A one-way process. There's no reverse reaction here. All of the molecules have been broken up. We can see it's been 100% broken, 100% dissociated. It's been fully ionized. Fully ionized. These are the kind of expressions that you come across. These molecules have been all broken up. And that's why hydrochloric acid is strong. As I say, it doesn't mean dangerous, it means fully ionized. It turns out that's unusual. There aren't too many fully ionized acids. Here's another one. Sulfuric acid, again, you probably think that represents sulfuric acid, but strictly speaking it doesn't. This represents a rather gooey liquid. This oily liquid only becomes an acid when it's added to water. When you take this substance, this hydrogen sulfate, and put it into water, it breaks up into hydrogen ions and sulfate ions. There they are. Sulfuric acid has hydrogen ions and sulfate ions, and it's classified as a strong acid, not because it's necessarily dangerous, but because it's completely broken up. It's 100% ionized. It's fully dissociated, completely broken apart by the water. And the same goes with nitric acid. Nitric acid is the other strong acid that you've met. So why do we look at these acids in the first, second, third, fourth year? Precisely because they're strong, because they're full of hydrogen ions, they behave really well, they give us good, good results. If we'd use what are classified as weak acids, then our chemistry might have been rather feeble at times. So, what do you mean by a weak acid? And you can think of some examples of a weak acid. Well, I mean, one good example of a weak acid is carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is what happens when carbon dioxide gas comes into contact with water. You notice it's a non-metal carbon, non-metal oxide. And non-metal oxides are usually gases, and when they dissolve in water, they usually form acids. But this one, when it dissolves in water, it doesn't form much of an acid. Only a tiny little bit of it goes on to form the acid. The vast majority doesn't. So we end up with just a small amount of dissociation, a relatively few molecules being broken up. The molecules which are broken up, oh yes, they form hydrogen ions, and carbonate ions, and this is our carbonic acid dissolved in water. But as acids go, it's pretty feeble stuff. It only breaks up a very, to a very small extent. It's classified as weak. Weak not because it's harmless, weak because it's only partially ionized. It only dissociates a little bit. And there are two others you're expected to know. Another one is sulfurous acid, not sulfuric, sulfurous acid, similar to this one, 
but not quite as weak. There are degrees of weakness. This is particularly weak, particularly feeble. Sulfuric acid is when sulfur dioxide dissolves in water, and sulfur dioxide is a pretty horrible gas. When it dissolves in water, it doesn't all react. A small portion of it reacts. The small portion which does react, once again forms hydrogen ions, that's when we're dealing with an acid, and this thing, sulfite ions. There, that's the acid. These ions are dissolved in water. But because it only does so to a limited extent, it's not classified as strong. It's, it's weak. It's a weak acid. Weak means only partially ionized. And of the three weak acids, carbonic, sulfurous, the other one we likely to come across is ethanoic acid. Ethanoic acid. Of course, it follows that if ethanoic acid is a weak acid, other carboxylic acids will be weak as well. Remember, ethanoic is only one of a family. Methanoic, ethanoic, propanoic, butanoic, pentanoic, they'll all be very similar. Ethanoic acids, here it is, CH3COOH, as before, is not an acid. Not until it's actually in contact with water. It's only when it comes into contact with the water that it's ionized. It breaks up, the molecule splits. It splits, and in the act of splitting, it forms hydrogen ions. And because it forms hydrogen ions, it's an acid. But the same story as before. It only does so to a limited extent, and that's why it's classified as weak. So you're expected to know the three strong acids, hydrochloric, sulfuric, and nitric, and the three that you've not met before, carbonic, sulfurous, and ethanoic. Now, a further point to this. Imagine you were to compare a strong acid with a weak acid. How would they show up? How, would you, how could you tell which was a strong one and which is a weak one? Imagine you were comparing hydrochloric acid, which is fully ionized, with the likes of ethanoic acid, which is only partially ionized. This acid probably has a hundred times more ions than the ethanoic acid. This is a hundred times more hydrogen ions. This is brimming with hydrogen ions. This, by comparison, only has one percent of the hydrogen ions in here. How, would you, how could you tell them apart? Well, one obvious difference would be the pH, the acidity. It follows this one is much more acidic, many more hydrogen ions. And being more acidic, then we'll have a lower pH. So the pH of this will be lower. This will have a higher pH. This might have a pH of, say, it depends how concentrated it is. This has got a pH of 1. Then this might have a pH of 3. Now you might think that's not much of a difference, but you might recall that on the pH scale, a difference of 1 on the pH scale is a factor of 10. So, 10 times 10 means a difference of 100. So these are sensible numbers. pH 1, pH 3. Other differences, apart from pH, how about rate of reaction? How quickly would you react with substances? If, for example, you drop some magnesium into these acids, you'd find that they reacted far more quickly with the strong acid, which is full of ions, than with a weak acid, which has only got one hundredth of the ions. So here we're looking at fast, a fast reaction for the strong acid, and a much slower reaction for the weak acid. How about um, conductivity? How would, you, how would you compare when you came to conducting electricity? Well, again, as you'd expect, the strong acid, which is full of ions, will be a far better conductor than the weak acid, which is far fewer. So, con conductivity of the strong acid is high, it's a high value. In comparison, the weak acid is low. But the one that's likely to crop up, and it's the most difficult one of all, involves a titration. It's the fourth difference we could check out. Titration. Now, what does that mean? Imagine setting up a burette, and in the burette you had alkali, something like sodium hydroxide solution. 
and you wanted to see how much of the sample I took to neutralize the strong acid and how much of the sample I took to neutralize the weak acid. What would you expect? Well, you expect it would take far more alkali to neutralize the strong acid than the weak acid. Let's face it, the weak acid is so feeble, surely a few drops of alkali will neutralize it. The strong acid, a hundred times more acidic, will surely require far more alkali. But in practice, that's not what happens. It turns out they're both the same. It turns out it doesn't matter if the acid is weak or strong. It doesn't matter if it's a weak acid or a strong acid. The quantity of alkali required to neutralize these is the same. Seems really bizarre. How can it take as much alkali to neutralize the weak one as a strong one? Let's get to the bottom of this. The strong acid is full of ions. The strong acid, hydrochloric acid, is fully ionized. It's completely broken up. And will take a lot, it will take a lot of alkali to neutralize all these hydrogen ions. We look at the weak acid. Now the weak acid has comparatively few ions. The weak acid only breaks up to a very small extent. So it has really not very many hydrogen ions at all. And so therefore you would expect it to require only a small quantity of alkali to neutralize it. This, this you think would require very little alkali, but not so. Because what happens is this. When the alkali is added, the alkali neutralizes these ions, it removes them. But that's not the end of the story. Because what will happen is the equilibrium will shift to the right to replace these ions. So we require more alkali to neutralize those. So we add more alkali. And as we keep adding more alkali, the equilibrium continues to shift, constantly replacing these ions until, guess what? It's completely shifted. In other words, if we keep adding alkali, we'll get to a point where this fully ionizes. The weak acid actually produces just as many hydrogen ions as a strong acid, and therefore requires just as much alkali for neutralization. Watch out for that one, it's proved a popular exam question over the years.